Hi everybody, welcome back to the Little Green Pasture. Glad to be back today. And I'm glad you're here too. I have a really good devotional I want to share with you today. And I believe with all my heart, it will minister to you. And I'm going to allow the living waters to flow as they always do. Because like I told you guys, I live at the well. And I hope that's where you live too, at the well of your salvation. I would rather live there than anywhere else. And it's a happy place to be. I, I love living there. Anyway, so I want to also uh, begin by welcoming you if this is your first time here. You are so welcome. I pray that you will be totally blessed. And I want to welcome all the new subscribers. You are so welcome here. And it's so nice of you to subscribe. I pray the Lord just blesses you. And just so you get to know a little bit about this channel, I, I usually don't like to call it a channel because long ago when I first started, um, I was so new to it. You know, I was on a minute to midnight for about nearly five years. I was a co-host with Tony and Brooke on a minute to midnight. And then it was time for me to go. Jesus wanted me to go and I'm still best friends with them, of course. But, uh, I remember, praying to the Lord. And I just would have this vision in my mind of holding a, like a little clump of dirt. And I'd be like, Lord, thank you so much for this little patch of dirt you've given me. And I was so grateful for it. Like, that's how I saw this. It's just, Lord, thank you so much for just this, this little patch of dirt, you know? And, um, and I remember praying that every single day and asking the Lord to grow me up in this and just to open up a well within me and a fountain and, and one day I was praying to him and the same thing. And I could just see my hand holding that little patch of dirt. And I was thanking him and I heard him say to me, it's no longer just a patch of dirt. It is now a little green pasture. I was so happy. So I want that to always be that to everybody that comes by, you know, I am imperfect. Um, I, but I love the Lord so much. And the greatest thing that we could do is talk about him. It says, talk about him from day to day, make known his name everywhere, speak about him everywhere you go. And there's been such a growth, but such a great joy in serving Jesus Christ and just being myself. Isn't that the best way? Haven't you noticed whenever you try to be too wordy or too intellectual, we just butt the Holy Spirit out and he's like, well, I guess you got it down, you know? And I, I don't ever want to do that again. You know, I, I just want to let those living waters flow and they will flow. All you have to do is live at the well. And that is this word. And the more you have his word in you, the more the Holy Spirit has workability in you and he will speak through you anyway. So another thing I want to say is, uh, I'm really glad you guys enjoyed having Ken I had Ken Bailey on Monday and I'm really glad you guys enjoyed him. And I really love him. You know, he wrote to me last night and he was like, Joni, my Facebook got hacked. Um, they took down my video and, and I mean, he wasn't worried and he wasn't panicked or anything. He was like, I'm used to it and it's all good, you know, but it goes to show the kind of world we're living in. But anyways, I'm going to get started because I want to get into these words that I saw and how God just shown his light on this. So I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for another day to be a great blessing to you, Lord, that you could look at someone like me, a perfect nobody, Lord Jesus, the base thing and the thing that is not a thing, not of noble birth, Lord, a blade of grass. And there's nothing lower on earth than a blade of grass. But like the old Puritan says, but that blade of grass reflects his glory and receives all the heat and warmth of the sun. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would be with my mouth and that you would be with my spirit and that you would speak through me, Lord God, the words of this life into the thirsty Lord Jesus, because they're not coming to hear from me and I don't want them to hear from me. I must decrease that you will increase and I am so full of joy to be able to do that because you are the all in all who fills all and in all to God be the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So, um, another thing I want to say is, uh, I am going to start reminding you guys to 
subscribe on Rumble. I have a Rumble account and as much as pos possible, go there and subscribe because you just never know what day any of us will wake up and they could scrap this YouTube channel. And if that happens, okay, you know, the Lord let it happen. And also too, I am on BitChute. And so I don't know why I keep forgetting to tell you guys that, but I'm going to start leaving the links. The, link, the Rumble link is down below, but I'll leave the BitChute link. And one more thing, uh, Brooke and I, um, we are still going to do a good Bible teaching, something flowing from our hearts once a week here. But we also now have a BitChute shoot account. I know this probably all sounds confusing, but by and by you guys will get used to it. Okay. So, oh, and one more thing, just one more thing. We are doing a recording today and it's going to be called the two famines. So look for it later on this evening because it'll be there on BitChute. and I'll leave the link below. I'll add it later on to this description box. So check back in the description box on this video later tonight. All right. So anyways, what I want to emphasize to you guys today is, you know, we're living lately where, I mean, stuff is popping like popcorn all around us. I mean, it's look here, look there, look what's happening now. Look what's, I mean, it's like we always, we literally actually cannot keep up what's going on geopolitically prophetically it's almost too much and on top of that there is so much deception there is so much false narratives there's so much uh lying signs and wonders of false doctrines and heresies i mean this is like in some big stew and so but one thing i want to always remind you which i'm firm about believing this and it really has been so clear to my own self as a Christian, as a believer, is that you're, the, the greatest foundation you can ever have are the very things that we take for granted, right? The simple things that we read about faith, hope, love, and we think we have them down. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that because, see, the thing that's coming, the things that are coming, if you are not on a firm foundation of his word, then what foundation are you going to stand on? when things happen suddenly like the power going out suddenly that can happen actually and it looks like there's a huge possibility that it can you know i mean just think of it you could say lord the darkness lord when i sit in darkness i will not fear for the darkness and the light are both alike to you or this um who is his servant that walketh in darkness and hath no light let him trust in the name let him trust in the lord and stay upon his name see those are our foundations and you know they're not just words remember that these words just think about it anybody can memorize these words anybody satan can remember satan has them memorized we know that because when we saw jesus on the mount you know when he after 40 days of fasting he said it is written it is written it is written and he was using jesus's word against himself but i'll tell you something right now satan satan does not fear a future faith he doesn't care if you go well you know i'll just believe the lord in that moment and you will but when you stand on his word and you say no weapon formed against me will prosper none no customized weapon for me no specialized fitted weapon just for me it's never going to prosper. You know, these words are going to stand the test of time. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord stands forever. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. And since you are going into the eternity of eternities and the forever world without end, then it's incumbent upon you to have these words carved into your heart so that there won't be a gra a, a, like your feet falling and when things happen. So the things that I share with you are wholesome words. They're good words. They establish your goings. They, they give you roots where you can take a weathering and a pounding from the storms of this life. So let me go on. 
and it's in Psalm 1, for, Psalm 40. It's Psalm 40. And I was just reading it. This was yesterday morning, but ever since yesterday morning, it's been speaking to me. And so let's begin. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible, horrible pit, out of a, out of a mire, the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even of praise unto my God, that many shall see and fear, and shall put their trust in the Lord. You see, whenever we wait for the Lord, David was a man, you know, it says about Jesus in the prophecy of him, in Isaiah 53, it says he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. So was David, really. I'm not trying to steal anything from the Lord, but David had a terrible life. You know, we think, oh, King David, you know, but David had a very miserable life. You know, from the time I believe he was 14 when he was, you know, called 16 when he sunk that stone into Goliath's head. And, you know, he was on the run for his life and, you know, the whole story of him. But I'll tell you one thing. He knew the Lord. And therefore, because his life was so awful and he was constantly waging wars and wars were constantly waged against him. And even in his own household, his he says, he even says at the end of his life, the last address that he gives, he says, though my house be not so with the Lord. Yet hath he established a covenant with me steadfast and sure. You know, and it's, he talked about that's all his joy and glory. And there was a cost to serving the Lord. And he just, and he blew it like everybody else. And we blow it all the time. But I'll tell you, there comes a time when we have to really get serious about what is coming down the road because it's coming fast and it's going to be upon us. And there's a lot of people out there and I'm, I've, I live around them. I see it all the time. They're like, there's plenty of food in the grocery store. That's just a bunch. That's just, you know, that's a bunch of lies and this and that. And, you know, and I thought, wow, you know what? A day is going to come upon you suddenly. I don't say that to them, but in my mind, I think it, and I don't mean to be mean about it, but I say, you know, what are you going to do when it comes suddenly? Where's your foundation? So, you know, we see that he waited patiently for the Lord and he, the Lord heard him. He delivered him. He established his going, put a song in his mouth. And he said that many shall see it and put their trust in the Lord. So the outcome of our deliverances that we get delivered from, from out of everything, that many are supposed to see the outcome of that. And and there's an established going. It says he established my goings. Every time God brings you out of something, he will establish your goings. But it's up to you to keep his word. It's up to you to keep yourself from idols. It's up to you to keep your heart in the love of God. It's up to you to, to keep yourself. And, and there is a responsibility that we have. And so I want to keep going. It says, blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside unto lies. So there's a blessing that he knows about because look, David is not a man where he's just going to say anything. I don't get that from him. Every word that he spoke is because it came out of a horrible situation. It came out of destruction. It came out of sore trials. It came out of defeat. It came out of a heavy affliction. Uh, it, it came, that's what came out of him. He was always being crushed. And so out of that crushing, he kept turning to the Lord. And so I love it. How it says, blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. He understood about what it meant to, there's a blessing in making the Lord his trust. And that has to be tested. And that may not be something you want to hear, but everything must be tested the same exact way as even Adam and Eve in the garden. It's like, oh, they were perfect, they were righteous, but it's like there is no one perfect but God. And their righteousness obviously had to be tested among many other things. And so everything that is in us, we can say we have faith, we can say we have trust, we can say we have love, but all those things really are a discipline. And that's a hard word to hear because it's like 
disciplined because we equate it with our parents. Like, oh man, we were in trouble um, or I got in trouble at work and uh, I got a ticket or whatever. But God doesn't discipline us like that. The disciplines of God are from our loving father who has a, a perfect plan for each of our lives. And we have to trust him because if you don't trust him, He's going to keep doing things and allowing things to push you into his presence so that you can rest in him, that you can trust him. I mean, really trust him by experience, not just say, I trust the Lord, because I'll tell you something. I remember when I was younger, I'd be like, yeah, I trust the Lord. And then I would get slammed down. Oh boy, it my <laughs> what I trusted in was shown. Okay, anyway, let me keep going because I want to get to the heart of this. He says um, that he doesn't respect the proud or turn aside to lies. So, you know, everything he's saying, again, he's saying from experience, like, obviously, um, there was a time in his life where he was showing respect to the proud. Maybe that was, you know, we all have that weakness and certain people were showing some kind of a respect that's not of God. But all it does is it corrupts them worse and worse because they think that they're deserving of that kind of bowing down to them or, or turn aside to lies. David obviously was lied to a ton of times in his life and he saw liars and he's like, I'm not having anything to do with lying. He even said in Psalm 119, he said, I hate the way of lying, but thy truth do I love. So in verse five, he said, now he recounts, he goes back, he says, many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works, which thou hast done and thy thoughts, which are to us word. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. And then, but the point he's making is now he's going over, obviously, that He's looking back at his life and he's remembering all the things that God had done for him. And, and you get the feeling where it's like, he has done so much for me. I don't even think I could even remember. Don't you ever, I've done that where I'm like, Lord, I wish I can remember everything you ever done for me because there's been so much that you've done for me and I don't remember it all. And even things I could not even know that you did for me when I could not even know it or even know now what you delivered me from. And in verse six, he says, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering thou hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now let me stop right there because I'm going to share something with you guys. Um, character building is big, to, is everything to the Lord with you and me, because it doesn't matter how many people know the word. If you have a terrible character, I will call that sins of disposition. Oh, your sins can be completely forgiven. And I'm, I'm glad that they are, but you can be like a quick tempered person. You, you can have, you can be a person whose anger is resting in your bosom. Um, you could be a person who's easily offended and that's pride. Um, there's all these different things of disposition. And that's what I would refer to as sins of disposition. It's kind of like another layer of looking at the whole round character of a Christian. Because you see, most of us start off serving him externally, but it has to go deeper and deeper. It has to carve down into you because that's why it's saying, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Notice that's it. That's external. That's all these things outside. And, but he says, my ears, oh, did you open? In other words, look, I appreciate what you're doing, but you need to hear something else. Because, you know, I think about Job after he went through everything and he was a religious man and he was a good man. He was a man that there was no one more righteous than Job during his day, a man that feared God and eschewed evil. And he woke up early in the morning every day. And he made sacrifices and prayers for his wicked children, he said, because they were really worthless children. I'm sorry to say that, but he said for perhaps, because he knew they were partiers. And he said, perhaps they've sinned against God and cursed him. And so at the end of Job's trial, according to scholars, that was two years. I don't know how they came up with that, but that's what they say. He said, 
for I, after God had spoken to him, starting in chapter 33, all the way to 40, he said, after God, God got done speaking to him about his great, he's like, where were you? He said, gird up thy loins like a man, O Job, and approach unto me. Where were you when I spanned the heavens? Where were you when I set the bars of the gates at the bottom of the sea? I mean, it, and he, you know how he goes on and on. And you know that whole thing was set to music. Do you know that? That's awesome. I can't even imagine. Anyway, but at the end when God was done talking, he said, now, now I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. And now doth mine eye see thee. And I abhor myself. And I repent in dust and ashes. You see, our eyes have to be open. Our ears have to be open because we think we're hearing and we're not. We think we're seeing, but we're not. And it's like, it's like trying to. It's like trying, like for instance, like, you know, when you oil wood and it sinks in, it's like trying to oil plastic. It's like we try to apply the word, but it doesn't work. It has to go into our heart. You know, like it says, what saith that the word is nigh thee in thine heart, even in thy mouth. That is the word of faith, which we preach. Right. And so when I saw that, let me pause right there. I have been struggling with a situation. Um, that I cannot get any victory over. And every time it comes my way, I lose my patience immediately. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's too personal. And it's about and it's something else. It's not like a personal, personal thing, but an outward thing. And I keep going to the Lord like, Lord, what's wrong with me? I can't have any power over this. I need your help. I need you to deliver me from impatience and unlovingness. Pow, I'm doing it again. And so one morning, one, so I was working one day on stuff in regards to all this stuff. And then I get a phone call and I'm like, you know, there's this, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, I, I'm going to be real. I'm, I'm going to be real. Okay. I'm not going to be like, Oh, I don't want to say anything. There's some things I won't say. Um, there is an elderly couple and I love them and they are in their eighties and they are just the loveliest people. And so I, I, they, one of them struggles very, very much. And this person has struggled their whole life very badly. And I have been praying for, for them on and off through the years. And in my older years, I've noticed that. I've been getting a little bit impatient. Um, and so I don't like that feeling of being impatient. And so I really took myself to the Lord and said, Lord, there's something wrong with me. Like I cannot serve you and be impatient because impatience um, is just, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And I just don't want that impatience in me. And so I just wrestled with it. So in the morning following, I'm reading this and I see this sacrifice and offering thou did not desire and i was reading my bible like the next day from that day before when i lost i didn't lose my temper but i was like oh you know and so the lord directly spoke to me i'm telling you he imprinted that in my heart he said you know i'm reading the words sacrifice and offering you didn't desire in other words he was saying to me I'm not desiring anything you're doing right now, Joni. I'm not desiring anything, but I want your ears to be open. I want you to hear me. And I could feel his presence and I know his voice and I know he, and it wasn't, I wasn't in trouble. There wasn't anything like that, but it was definitely him speaking to me. And I read, my ears has thou open. And it goes on to say, burnt offering and sin offering thou did not require. And then he speaks and he says, lo, I come in the volume of this book, of the book. It is written of me. Now, David goes on to say, I delight to do thy will. Oh, my God, thy laws within my heart. And the Lord really showed me that. Yes, he spoke about sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings, sin offerings. But really, the Lord was showing me that um, 
it's not always about religious exercises. I don't think God is, you know, I mean, it's one thing we're in our words every day. We want to be in the word every day. I will be in the word every day. We're told, you know, let not, let not thine eyes depart from my word. Keep it in the midst of your heart. And I mean, it's over all over the place. But he was dealing with a character issue with me. And I want him to deal with it with me because it cannot live within this temple. It has no business being in here. It doesn't benefit me. Impatience does not benefit you. And so he showed me, I delight to do thy will. And he said, oh God, yea, thy laws within my heart. And so we talked about doing God's will. And, but let's see what God's will was. Because he goes on to say, in verse 9, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I like it. I like that when he says, O Lord, thou knowest. In other words, Lord, we have a relationship. You know me. I couldn't say that to somebody I don't know. I could not say to somebody, you know me. You know what I'm trying to say to you. They would be, I wouldn't say that to them. And it would be unfair to say that to them. It wouldn't even make sense to say that. But when you say, you know me. You can only say that to somebody you're in complete and total close communion with and union. He goes on to say, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. And here's the word that really stuck out to me. He said, withhold not. And when I saw those words, it just stuck there like god took a nail and a hammer right he's the hammer and the nail and it just went into withhold not thy tender mercies from me O lord and thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me and i'm not going to read the rest of it you can but the point i'm making is uh that god was showing to me it's like and i and i could hear I could hear him saying to me within my heart, um, um, don't bother reading my word. Don't go back to it. Go your way. And, you know, he will deal with each of us. I'm not saying God is saying this to you. Just take it for what it's worth. I'm only sharing to you what happened to me. But I can feel the Lord saying to me, um, don't even go forward in my word. Don't bother reading it. Don't bother reading it and continuing in it unless you do it. Because when you read it, you must do it. There's no, there's no excuse. And I've been in the Lord a long time. There's no excuse for me. Now, of course, I don't hold myself up to some ridiculous standard, like I'm some robotic uh, perfection. No way. In fact, the older I get, the more clear I get the real view of myself. But I like it. I want to know what's in me and I want God to deal with me. And you want God to deal with you. You know why? Because he only chastens those that he loves. So you could be a partaker of his divine nature so that living waters will flow through you. You will be a riverbed of his glory where living waters flow. But if there's anything in you, he's not going to let that holy water touch it. And I don't want anything in me. And so, so I can feel the Lord strongly emphasizing to me that reading his word and doing it um, is a sacrifice and offering, right? But to read his word and not doing it, he's not interested in it. He doesn't want it. In other words, don't practice reading his word and then going your way like a man who looks at them at himself in a mirror and he turn, goes away and forgets what he looks like. And God really dealt with me that day. And I repented of impatience and because Love is patient. And that's the first thing he told me. And, you know, aren't we going to need patience in what's coming up? Because I'll tell you something. What is coming? It is going to try your patience. Okay. When there's no food, your patience is going to, that's going to be tested. And, and when, if, if the power goes out, your patience and love is going to be tested. Love is patient. And it's, and it's called in the word, Paul calls it the kingdom of patience the God of patience. And so we need to have that patience. But if you're not in his word, what do you have to stand on? 
because he is the rock, the spiritual rock that the children in Israel drank from, that spiritual drink. And it said, and he followed them in the desert. And goodness and mercy will follow us in this desert called the earth because Satan turned it into a wilderness. So in other words, when he said, withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. In other words, I felt like he was saying in this really good, because listen, the way David talks to the Lord, you can only talk like that to somebody you're in deep relationship with, where you can go, look, I'm going to just let it all hang out. This is what I want to say. You know, don't you have those times where you just want to just not pray these kind of wordy prayers and you just want to get down to it because that's truly the prayer. And don't be afraid to talk to God that way. You're not going to turn him away. I think that's really when he listens is when we cry out unto the Lord. He says in the word, I mean, I counted so many times where it says, for I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. My voice came unto him, into his temple and into his holy ears into his holy temple and even into his ears. I can keep going on and on, but there's something about a heart cry and that's the prayer. In other words, in verse 11, when he says, withhold thy, not thy tender mercies, he he's understood, you know, that his tender mercies, he's like, he's remembering how God had delivered him as we read in the before, but he's looking forward Again, there's something happening, read the rest of the chapter, where he needs God's mercies again. And, you know, we, we need to focus on God's mercy. Because when we pray for God's mercy, God says, when He those cries came into his temple, holy temple and into his ears, you know what the next verse was? Then the earth shook. The earth shook. In other words, in essence, David is saying, you know, where I was reading, I have preached righteousness as a great congregation. I have not refrained my lips and so on. I take it as him saying, I have not withheld preaching your righteousness. I have not withheld preaching your righteousness in the great congregation. I have not withheld refraining my lips. I, oh Lord, you know, I have not refrained thy righteousness within my heart. I have, and let me re-say that. I have not withheld hiding thy righteousness within my heart. I have not withheld declaring thy faithfulness. I have not withheld thy salvation. I have not withheld concealing thy loving kindness. I have not withheld thy truth from the great congregation. In other words, that's what he's saying because he's saying, withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. I just want to say this, we're entering into a time right now that's very serious. And what we know now will never be again. It's not coming back. And when you think of the fact that God gave a hundred years to Noah to build that ark, he also gave us, when it was all done, he said, get in the ark. And then he spoke to Moses in the ark and he said, yet seven days, I will flood the earth. He gave everybody a seven day day grace period. Now it has been well over 6,000 years that Jesus has been gone. And we would call this the sixth day. And the seventh day would be the millennial kingdom. You know, I think about the grace period of the church age, and it's almost over. And, you know, some people, you know, write to me and they go, well, I don't understand prophecy. It's like, it's okay. It's okay. Don't weary yourself with trying to figure out every detail, okay? Just just go with the Lord. Be at peace. Rest in him. But don't get caught up. You know, there's so many people like I'm so confused. I'm I don't know if there's a rapture. I don't know. I I I'm confused. It's like, look, don't worry about it. Okay? Jesus Christ is going to take care of you. He's going to take care of us. Just like he took care, he has a perfect track record in the Bible. And if you have read his whole Bible, you're included in that. Your name may not be written in there like David's, but you're very much included in that. Because when you see where we are today, you're alive right now in that book of Revelation. 
So yes, you are included in the Bible. You are part of the Bible right now. And we know how it's going to go. And whatever your belief is, don't fight with each other about it. Because I believe what has happened is we learned as God's people, we have developed talents and skills of weaponry to, to fight and use God's sword like Peter did with Malchus's ear and sliced it up sliced it off thinking he was doing God, helping Jesus. Okay. And you know what? We never learned to fight the enemy. Instead, we were taught to fight each other and I'm not going to fight anybody. You know why? Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And you know what? Your warfare is his word. And you know what is the force behind it? The Holy Spirit. And so when you are in his word, that's his arsenal. That's his weaponry. And I want to encourage you right now before I go. I'm not talking about, re I'm not talking about earning mercy. So some of you might be going, well, that sounds like she's saying that we have to do all these things in order to get mercy. Well, there is something to that. He said, unto the merciful, I will show myself merciful. And to the shrewd, I'll show myself shrewd. And to the pure, I'll show, show myself pure. You know, I think about what he says. Because of that man, he did not show mercy. See, God is a God of mercy. And if, and if you've ever received the mercy of God, it's nothing like the mercy of men or women. Now, it's been wonderful that they've helped us. But you know what? When God gives mercy, there's a power in that. Because it's not just somebody opening a door and helping you get through something. But everything God does enlarges itself like the sand of the sea. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, in closing, I want to say be established. Right? He said he established my goings. You know something? If your ways are established before the Lord, you are not don't have anything to worry about. Jesus says don't fear what they fear. You're in this world. You're not of it. You're just passing through this. That's why godliness with contentment is great gain. You've brought nothing into this world, and it is certain you're going to carry nothing out. And aren't you glad about that? So anyways, I want to just encourage you, stand upright. Put your shoulders back. Don't be afraid what man can do unto you. If God be for you, who is it that's going to be against you? And when when we do come, a, come to certain things that are going to be hard, then you know what? Jesus says, who is the wise man? But he that heareth my word. And he goeth, and he heareth my word and doeth it. For he is like a man who hath built a house, who dug down deep into the rock and built it. And the floods came, and the streams beat vehemently upon it, and it would not fall. It couldn't fall, for it was founded upon a rock. But, he, but the one that didn't hear my words is like the foolish one who went and built his house upon the earth. I like how Luke says it. Matthew says it differently. Luke says, upon the earth, he said, and when the uh, floods came and the streams beat vehemently on the house, it said, his house fell and great was the fall of it. So the house of the righteous will stand. Okay. And God will feed you. He says, trust in the Lord and do good. And you shall be fed. Right. So trust in the Lord, your God. He has a perfect track record and he will feed you and he will keep you unto that day that you either die and go home to be with the Lord or you're raptured. And that's what I believe. And if you don't believe that until you make it through the seven year tribulation and he'll keep you then he will keep you all the way into his heavenly kingdom world without end.